Well, hi there. Uh, good evening. I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this screening of a riveting new documentary, The Destruction of Memory, with a panel discussion to follow. The half-hour portion of the film that we'll be showing focuses on Syria and Iraq, the so-called cradle of civilization, and illustrates dramatically the shocking, willful acts of destruction and looting of symbols and objects and places of worship by Daesh or ISIS in what amounts to an attempt to extinguish past cultures, erase past civilizations, and kill off individual identities. It then gives examples of the heroic attempts by people, sometimes at the cost of their lives, to protect, salvage, and rebuild these precious symbols of cultural heritage, in some cases using scanning techniques and 3D technologies that have only recently come into being. The question is posed, is this not a war crime, a grave crime against humanity, a form of cultural genocide that should be addressed under international statutes. Co-sponsoring this event with IPI are the permanent mission of the Netherlands and, and of Italy. So before we roll the film and then impanel our commentators for the panel afterwards, we will hear brief welcoming remarks First from Lee Grigoire, the Deputy Permanent Representative of the Netherlands to the United Nations, and then from Inigo Labrentini, the Deputy Permanent Representative of Italy. So Ambassador Grigoire, you come take my place here. Thank you very much. And, and thank you for having me at this uh, very important evening, ladies and, uh, and gentlemen. And, Thank you for all for participating tonight. I'm really happy to see such a full room here. Uh, and I want to thank the International Peace Institute for organizing, organizing this documentary screening um, and bringing to the attention, uh, bringing to the at attention to the destruction of cultural heritage. On, on my way walking here, I had this song in my head. Uh, it was the Spice Girls, I think. It's, it's a, tell me what you want, what you really, really want. And it was like, if you want my future, forget my past. And I thought, that is a really strange song, actually. I was, it came into my head when I was preparing this. Um, because uh, if you want my future, you need your past. You're nowhere without your past. Um, and, and destruction of cultural heritage affects the identity of groups. Um, culture defines our identity and our future. And the attempts to deliberately erase a culture, such as happened in Syria and Mali, are extremely worrisome. And unfortunately, taking a place as a at a very, long, a very large scale as we speak now. And it's, as, as you said, it's not collateral damage, it's actually a weapon of war. And Tim Slade's documentary, there you are, um, the destruction, destruction of memory underscores the link between conflict and culture. And he shows us in a very good way how destruction of cultural her heritage strikes at the very foundations of a society, deliberately uh, erasing common roots and destroying the social fabric. But he also shows how reconstruction of that same heritage can be cru a crucial tool towards reconciliation in that conflict. I want to commend our friends and partners <laughs> from Italy, that you, you will be seeing us a lot together in the coming years. Um, and uh, Italy has actively pr promoted the protection of cultural heritage throughout their campaign for a seat in the Security Council. Um, they have set up, in collaboration with UNESCO, and I'm sorry, Inigo, if I'm taking your lines now, <laughs> a task force for the protection of cultural heritage in crisis situations. And as a part of our split security uh, council term in 2017 and 2018, we will continue to work very closely together um, with our fr Italian friends in this particular area, and we will also do our share. To give you an example of what the Netherlands is doing, um, in Mali, for example, during the 2012 crisis, 
uh, the Netherlands has helped to save 95% of the 16th century Malinese manuscripts that form a wealth of knowledge of science, medicine, math, and culture. Another practical example is a, a four-week training which the Netherlands organized in Amsterdam and in Washington, D.C., where practitioners from conflict areas received training how, on how to save cultural heritage and how to conduct a damage assessment and how to eva evacuate heritage. And such concrete forms of support can make a different on, difference on the ground in conflict areas. IPA has brought together a panel of wonderful experts that you will see after the film to guide us through tonight's screening and discussion. And I wish you all a very inspiring evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you to, uh, to, to, to having me tonight. Th thank you to the organizer, thank you, congratulations for the realization. You know, um, I would like to start on a personal uh, touch. Um, like many Italians, especially Italians of my generation, my study are basically a classical study. The Liceo Classico, we call it in Italy. I studied for more than 10 years Latin. I studied ancient Greek for five years. I hated ancient Greek, I have to say, when I was a student. Um, we studied by far more uh, the Roman history than the 20th century history. So we know by heart better uh, Caracalla, Julius Caesar than uh, Mussolini or Stalin. That's, that's typical of my generation. And I remember when I was uh, uh, young, I was a student, uh, I was quite jealous to the fact that, of course, Rome was the biggest empire in the history. Rome was the empire that basically uh, built the first century of Europe. But there were someone that were before us. And it was very disturbing for me, the Egyptian, uh, the Greek, of course, and the Mesopotamia. And the idea that now, and you know, Mesopotamia, had, had, still has, but had incredible, incredible um, uh, piece of the ancient history. There are some um, archaeological sites that are incredible in the world. I'm from Napoli, so I, I basically I have Pompeii 40 kilometers from my home. But what I have seen in Iraq, it's, it was incredible. And the idea that someone could build um, a political, uh, religious and also criminal activity in destroying this uh, important, important piece of our history is something that uh, really uh, struck me a lot. So I really welcome an initiative like uh, uh, you have done uh, tonight. Uh, and I thank that you remember what we actually we have started in, uh, not only here in, in New York with the cultural editors, but a long time ago. The, um, the Italian Carabinieri, the military police of Italy, has been the first one in the world who created a special section from the beginning for um, fight the uh, trafficking of uh, artistic uh, issues. Uh, one of the privilege to be Italian is you have a little bit of knowledge of the criminal activity in the world for all, all our national history. And actually, we created this corp in the 60s because in Italy, we discover first that every, everyone that the mafias in the world they are investing in artistic uh, artifact. Uh, now everybody knows. I, I, I presume that in this room, a lot of people have seen Narcos, you know, the, the Netflix series on Pablo Escobar, and everybody now knows that Pablo Escobar bought a lot of uh, uh, artistic pictures, etc. This started by far before in Italy, in Sicily, and in my region, and in Campania. And creating for this, actually, we created a know-how that has been the basis for all the uh, today international activity in the, in the world. I remember uh, um, I was in a meeting here in, uh, and then I stop. I was in a meeting uh, in the United Nations, one of the first meeting on cultural heritage, et cetera. And uh, I remember a lady that, for me, she looked like a, a you know, a, teacher of high school of Maryland. And actually, she was a colonel of the Marines. And she spoke a lot about the American activities in uh, fight against artistic trafficking, uh, speaking about cooperation among United States and Austria. And then she handed saying, but if you want a point of reference, if you want someone who knows how to do this, 
we have to think to the Italian Carabinieri. And the Italian Carabinieri, uh, and this is my last word, I'm sorry that I didn't read the, <laughs> the speech, and the Italian Carabinieri were the first one who helped the Iraqi authority to recreate the Baghdad Museum of Art that was totally lost and destroyed in 2003, and today is still there. Thank you, enjoy the, the movie. Not just about bricks and stones. It's really about some important message. It's the way we see human civilization evolving and developing. Let's not forget again this is a weapon of war. It's killing the identity of others. How could this happen to monuments that have survived the ravages of the environment, natural disasters? And in this 21st century, we are seeing a willful destruction of these things. Part of war and conflict has always been the collateral damage. Buildings have fallen in the path of military objectives, but there has always been another war going on. One of the ways to get rid of history is by remove all the physical traces of the history. And make believe that nothing ever happened, nothing was ever there. You can't find any artifacts, you can't find anything, because everything has been, has vanished. In this war, Buildings aren't destroyed because they're in the way of a target. The buildings are the target. People are people within the place. Their history, their identity, how they draw meaning about who they are happens in a place. And what happens to that place matters. Those buildings are part of who they are. There were grenades, there were killings, there were expulsions everywhere, but I just reacted most profoundly when I heard about the Oriental Institute. Somehow I just put two and two together, I think, for the first time, where I thought, this is not just about somebody expressing their momentary anger and killing other people. This is somebody who knows what is held in that library. They know what they are doing, and they are doing it for a particular purpose. This is not just, this is not going to go away. They are rewriting history at this very moment. A century of wave after thunderous wave of destruction. This war against culture is not over. It's been steadily increasing. How can we stem its path and save the story of who we are? These acts of vandalism are a tragedy for all civilized people. And the civilized world must take a stand. <clears throat> I've seen that film three times in the last two days, and you still just shudder when you see the destruction of those ancient monuments. Um, we have an excellent panel to discuss the meaning of what we've just seen. You have their full biography, so let me just introduce them briefly in the order in which they will speak. Uh, Karima Banoon has been since November of 2015 the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights. She is professor of law at the University of California at Davis, and she is also the author of a book called Your Fatwa Does Not Apply Here, a book that we featured here at IPI three years ago in our Distinguished Author series. She earned her BA in History at Brown, her MA in Middle Eastern and North African Studies at the University of Michigan, and her doctorate in Law from the University of Michigan Law School. Tim Slade is the writer, director, producer of the excellent film you have just seen, or a portion of which you have just seen, and a filmmaker whose works have been screened at more than 60 international festivals. He earned his BA in Fine Arts from the University of South Wales. And Bonnie Burnham is President Emerita of the World Monuments Fund, the organization she joined in 1985 as Executive Director and then served as President after 1996. She holds degrees in art history from the University of Florida and the Sorbonne. We'll do a few questions here, and then I'd love to get some comments from the floor. Um, Karima, at the end of the film, we see the conviction before the International Criminal Court of a man for having deliberately bombed 10 buildings of cultural significance in Timbuktu. Understanding that the best way to stop this kind of thing is always prevention, 
Is this approach, treating the willful destruction of cultural heritage as a crime, as a violation of human rights, is this the way the international community can best combat this? And let me just tell you, by the way, you have my permission to, in your answer, include the fact that tomorrow you will be presenting a report to the General Assembly. Well, first let me say thank you so much to IPI for hosting and to the missions of the Netherlands and Italy for supporting uh, this important event. Your question is a very important one, and I think you are absolutely right to start off with the idea that prevention should always be the priority, certainly with tangible cultural heritage sites, uh, monuments, uh, ruins. Once they're destroyed, uh, that is an irreversible process even in a digital age. So by the time we get to prosecution, unfortunately, in a sense, we've already failed. And yet when destruction does occur, it is essential that there be accountability. Uh, and one of the recommendations that I make in my report that I'm presenting tomorrow uh, to the General Assembly uh, at 3 o'clock, in case anyone is interested in coming, uh, is precisely that governments need uh, to do all that they can to collect and preserve evidence uh, so that such prosecutions can take place, including in the very difficult environments of conflict and post-conflict. Um, <clears throat> Tim, I think, did I? Excuse me, have I got the order wrong here? Uh, or um, I'm sorry, Bonnie, I was going to ask you, Bonnie. Um, we saw in the film that people have lost their lives in this effort. What does the international community need to do to offer support and protection to those that the new report calls uh, cultural heritage defenders? Well, I, I think that this prosecution uh, in Mali and the fact that uh, this person has now been convicted and uh, given a prison sentence turns the page in, in the way of public perception and the teeth that we can have through international law and international public opinion in relation to this issue. Because so many people up until now have felt that uh, it's just not as important as human life. And uh, we in the heritage sector have always said human life and the human in the context of human life are inseparable and you are depriving people of aspects of their life when you deprive them of the context that nurtures that and so we've seen these very powerful examples of that in recent years uh, as, as a result of ISIS and even going back to the bombing on Buddhists and Robert Beef in his books makes uh, states that uh, in the 20th century cultural heritage became a weapon of war. It was not just something that was in the path accidentally. And, and so now we're living in a different world and there is much more public recognition. That's probably the most important thing people internationally can do. There is a new effort being uh, put together right now and will be announced in a couple of weeks. Uh, by a number of governments, the French government, uh, together with the government of the United Arab um, Emirates, to uh, create a, a decent-sized trust fund so that uh, the kinds of things that are talked about in this film, the idea of um, bringing uh, more training to people in the field so that they can more successfully defend these sites, uh, the idea of stopping international traffic, um, by enforcing it with laws, the idea of prosecutions, all of that um, could flow out of this effort. And I think it's a, it's a tremendous um, initiative. It, it shows that the world is really beginning to wake up and realize this is something important. Uh, Tim, first of all, congratulations on the film. Uh, we have high levels of combat and aerial bombing going on at the moment uh, in Syria in particular. Are some of the steps we saw being taken in the film to protect cultural treasures working in such an atmosphere? And how about the argument that the destruction was undertaken out of, quote, military necessity? So I think, uh, firstly, that, you know, for example, the, uh, the Maram Mosaic Museum that we look at in the film, that was a, a good news story on that level in the sense that, you know, the work that people were able to do with, uh, custodians at that museum in, in Turkey um, was able to be transported back to Syria and to actually have an effect there when there was bombing of the museum. 
I think obviously in a city like Aleppo, you know, that sort of protection becomes very difficult because of the intensity, as you say. And at that point, I think, you know, it's important, as Karima touched on, that documentation is really done to as high a level and as complete a level as possible, um, both in terms of evidence, um, if there is a, a an international court or a, a tribunal, an ad hoc tribunal that's set up to assess um, the type of damage and that was that has been done, and in particular instances, specifically, I think to chat to try to close the loophole of arguing military necessity. Um, also, you know, as we as we see in the film, on the level of possible reconstruction, um, not necessarily physical reconstruction, because I think you know Bonnie and I have discussed this. You know, the level of documentation already of Aleppo is actually quite high, so you could. You could technically rebuild every street if you really wanted to, but I think in other, for other types of memorialization or other approaches to rebuilding that are taken later, um, you know, obviously in the case of Aleppo, it's, as we all know, it's, I mean, how to start to approach that is an incredibly complex issue because of the level of damage that the city has sustained. But, but in any case, you know, technology, you know, that you're mentioning is, is thankfully being used. And, I mean, the, and the 3D technology you mentioned, and we saw some of that there. Yes. Uh, they can actually recreate these things, yes? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, the, I think the thing with the 3D reconstructions is that you need, a, you need a lot of data to go in. So, for example, with Morrison's work, she needed as many photographs of that statue as possible to be able to create a 3D. Um, structure, obviously, you know, the sort of work that SIAC and others are doing with um, 3D scanning makes that a much more um, uh, accurate process and that scanning can be done in a fairly contained period of time. So, mm -hmm. Karima, just one last point. Uh, you're a lawyer uh, and you're delivering a report tomorrow, the General Assembly. Um, as a lawyer, do you see a real path towards creating a body of law which will bring all of this under the rubric of, of international humanitarian law? Uh, I think that both international humanitarian law and human rights law are important here. Uh, and in fact, they're essential complements uh, one to the other. I agree that this case, the Al-Mahdi case, was a very important, uh, sort of a landmark uh, event. Uh, and I was very pleased to see that in that uh, case, and there was, a, of course, as we know, a guilty verdict, a nine-year sentence, uh, I was very pleased to see that in that case, uh, the court said that the crime was one of, quote, significant gravity. So really recognizing uh, the seriousness of the harm. Uh, and I think that that is essential. But I think also if we're going to really move forward to implement the law that we have, whether it's humanitarian law, uh, whether it's the cultural heritage specific uh, standards, whether it's the relevant uh, human rights law, we need to really understand the connection, uh, as Bonnie alluded to, between uh, the sites, between heritage and people. Uh, and that connection really I see through the prism of human rights. I understand cultural heritage uh, primarily, uh, from my view, as a human rights issue. Uh, because when those sites are destroyed, it is people's identity that's attacked. It's their ability to exercise their freedom of religion uh, and many other uh, human rights, freedom of expression, uh, the right to education, the right to learn uh, history, and so on. Uh, and I do think that some of the criticism of the International Criminal Court over the case uh, and of the prosecutor was unfair because it reduced these simply to, quote, property offenses without understanding the impact, in fact, on people. And if you talk to Malians, I was in Mali in 2012 before I became Special Rapporteur doing academic research. If you talk to Malians, they were as upset uh, about this as they were about the other atrocities uh, that were going on. And so I think understanding you know, that connection between human rights, human beings, uh, and heritage, and indeed other atrocity crimes, is essential to going forward with the body of law uh, that we'd all like to see. The other word I always think about is identity. I mean, the, the theft of identity. Um, uh, Bonnie, do you have any more thoughts before I'm going to go to the audience and, and uh, and ask for their reactions and questions. Uh, uh, I think you can go ahead. This has sort of been your life, I mean, in the <laughs> World Monuments it, Fund. It, it really has, and, and Tim was referring to 
the complexity of the reconstruction process and the and their references in the film to the idea that you can't you may be creating a memory of something that's been destroyed a replica uh, but you're it's not the same thing yeah. and there's no way to re really turn back the clock and repair the harm that's been done now uh, and and it, it, there's going to be such a, an enormous gap between the way life was lived in this part of the world and the way it can be lived in the future. And the disruptions of the population as well will only further underscore that. So we're going to have a big challenge in front of us, and we need all the firepower <laughs> we can get. Uh, Tim, on that same point, what kind of reaction have you had to the film? How widely have you shown it? Uh, can you measure yet any impact and any actions that are coming out of having shown the film? Yeah, look, I mean, it's interesting. It, it, you know, in an ironic in an ironic way, you know, the film is sort of released at a good time in terms of the fact that this issue is um, getting attention. Um, obviously, it's you know not a good thing because the, the destruction is happening. But I think you know, it's obviously, thankfully, it's sort of timely message. Um, you know, the film's been shown quite a lot in the United States and in Canada and in Europe and elsewhere. And I think what's good that I've noticed is that it's being seen by different audiences and um, audiences, you know, such as the one here tonight, which includes representatives of governments, is really crucial because, you know, as Karima and Bonnie know, that's really the, probably the most important audience in a way because if there are to be developments in legal frameworks or policy that has to start with the UN and, and member states. So, um, yeah. In that connection, we're being webcast, so yes. that expands <laughs> the audience. Um, any thoughts or comments or questions from the floor? Um, let me start with the ambassador in the front row, and I'll get back to you in a minute. Sorry, I don't want to, <laughs> but I have to leave in really five minutes just to, to words. Uh, I fully understand what you say when you say that the destruction is irreversible even if don't underestimate the capacity of reconstruction, uh, the Mostar bridge is there. So, of course, it's by far more difficult to reconstruct than an ancient ark in Palmyra, but never says never. Now, what I, I think it's important to say, especially in those days, this is also a, a film that calls for accountability. Because the pres preservation is important, but it's also important. I think the last scene that we have seen in the International Criminal Court, he one of the most powerful message that the film could send. But this is very important to stress this in the same days that for just internal political situation, important countries are living in the International Criminal Court. This is something important to stress. Mm -hmm. The only way to uh, uh, overcome crisis like this is the international cooperation built on international law and the accountability for the people who don't respect this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Inigo. And I'll understand if you have to leave. Uh, the, in the back, I think I saw. Uh, uh, well, I've, I've got more than more than two. Let's do, let's do about two or three ones. The gentleman there, and then the woman right in front of him. Remember these questions. We'll take them in order. Hi, I'm. Uh, my name is Jose Vericat. I'm an advisor at at IPI. Um, thanks so much for the, for the really stimulating movie. Um, part, I spent part of my time analyzing the discourse of um, Islamist organizations, uh, quite an unsavory task. And um, in, in terms of the way, I think it's interesting the way that ISIS frames such attacks. I think one of the, um, one of the people that you've interviewed mentioned how they're used to such a great effect. I mean, and, and this is so much part of everything that ISIS does, which is about attracting attention. And, uh, and you know, they clearly know that this is a very, very soft uh, spot, soft nerve. But the way they frame this as well is in terms of um, Western hypocrisy, um, which is a major narrative of, of ISIS. Um, and that is among, in this particular case, um, the, the, the Western hypocrisies of the interest being taken in stones over human beings. Um, and that resonates enormously in the, in the Middle East region. Um, so I think it which is, you know, it's a, it's a very valid um, uh, point and, 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 and interesting to, to take account of. And I think perhaps in order to acknowledge this, um, I think it's also very important to put this in context and to say that the destruction of cultural heritage sites are not the monopoly by any means of, 
of ISIS, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. In the pages of the New York Times, we've been reading about you know, Saudi Arabia specifically bombing cultural heritage sites in Yemen. Um, the, uh, the, you know, the, the destruction of archaeological sites is a, has been a major subtext of uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And, uh, and of course, to go further back in history, we can talk about carpet bombing of Germany, et cetera. So putting that in context, I think it's, a, it's an important part of, uh, of, of presenting this, uh, this sort of uh, argument. Thank you. Thank you. Jose, just pass that microphone to the woman right in front of you, I mean, in front. Excellent. And could I ask you to identify yourself? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Jillian Abali. I'm with the World Council of Churches, based here in this building at the United Nations office. Um, through our fellowship and our member churches, we represent about 25% of Christians globally. Um, and we all know that many of these conflicts um, are often tagged as religious, while at the same time we also know that there are so many interests at play. Um, and we at the World Council of Churches have also been playing crucial roles in interreligious dialogue and accompaniment programs of our member churches and our constituencies of advocacy, etc. I'd be curious to hear from you what you see um, how you've included religious or faith communities in your work and or um, how you see their role um, playing out in this type of preservation of cultural and also religious heritage in many ways as well. Did I see a third question? Yeah, on the left and then we'll take the all three at once. Oh, hi, my name is Terry Ann Hurlhe and I'm just from the Metropolitan Opera, but I had attended a session at um, St. Gregory, Gregory the Illuminator Church, uh, right before uh, the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. And they had a couple of workshops. One was a literature workshop, a history workshop. And I have to say that this community has been hit very hard before um, all of this had happened, because they were sort of still grappling uh, one year before the 100th anniversary how they were going to experience it. and. In terms of what the United Nations does, I mean, uh, this person associated with the World Council of Churches sort of touched upon my question. Like, you have a film, um, so you, you present the film, and, and if you know this is available to them and the Armenian prel prelacy, as well as the Assyrian Christian community in New York, as well as abroad, it, it is free, of course, hopefully. But do you have like contact information for them, something solid that they can work with? Because I'm sure that they have pictures of everything that was associated with Aleppo. Um, however, in terms of, you know what I mean, dealing with the whole workshop that is needed to really help them rebuild, you know, it is a very delicate issue and I'd like to know how to maybe present this to them. Uh, and I just wanted to close with this. Um, there was a, a real um, appeal to not have Aleppo bombed, but uh, this, this appeal was two years ago. And so that means that it was, it was a very fresh wound then. And now, you know, like, it's just, um, you know, mind boggling what they must be going through right now and what I'm in a sense going through I can't even really you know discuss it it's just so profound mm -hmm. so but you know thank you very much for for your presentation thank you Karima do you want to take any part of those questions you like thank you very much well I'm very grateful for the question about faith leaders because it's the perfect cue for the announcement that I wanted to the other announcement that I uh, wanted to make and you kindly said that I could I'm having a side event on Thursday uh, and I'm afraid at this point it's only open to people with UN uh, credentials because of the RSVP uh, procedure but one of the people speaking there is Father Najib Michael uh, who is a, an Iraqi priest who has been involved and in fact risked his life to save many ancient uh, manuscripts and we'll be hearing from him uh, exactly on that issue of sort of the role of his particular faith uh, community in the preservation of uh, heritage. Uh, but, and this ties into the first question, there will also be people there addressing, for example, the destruction of indigenous uh, heritage, uh, which has happened in many regions of the world, something that I also talk about uh, in my report. Unfortunately, systematically uh, in many p cases, and this remains an ongoing struggle. And I think part of the answer to that question about hypocrisy is how important it is to use this 
what I call sort of the Palmyra moment to respond not only to incidents like Palmyra, but all of the other forgotten incidents of destruction of cultural heritage, whether in the past or uh, ongoing. And I think that is critically uh, important, and I certainly take the point uh, that we, we don't want to harness the issue of cultural heritage uh, to a political agenda. We want to look at it universally. Uh, and I think that that is uh, incredibly important. And as to the last question, all I wanted to say is, uh, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but uh, my mandate, the Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, has a communications procedure available uh, whereby information can be shared with me, uh, including from civil society organizations, uh, about issues which can then be raised confidentially with governments, uh, you know, it can sometimes have some uh, impact, and I can give you that information uh, and the information with regard to other mandates afterwards. Thank you. Bonnie, do you have any thoughts or comments? Yes. Um, I will say, first of all, that religious sites tend to be the uh, target of many of these, uh, these attacks. Uh, it, it extended with the ISIS to museums because they were there in Mosul, but they also bombed, they also destroyed a mosque in Mosul. And I think that it actually, in my mind, dates back to Kristallnacht and mm. that moment when um, the synagogues were, and that was just a kind of spontaneous uh, event where suddenly people all over the country out of paranoia rose up and they decided to to destroy these symbols because they were saying to the people, we can't tolerate your differences from us. And that's what's happening now in this part of the world. And it's why, um, and it's very intentional, and the, the Christian community is so deeply embedded in, in the Middle East, but uh, there are virtually no Christians left, I think, in Syria any, or Iraq anymore, so it's very hard to know who will be the defenders of this heritage. But it's tremendously important also as a rallying point it, at the moment that the conflict ends. And it's hard to imagine how the world will deal with punitive actions against uh, those who've been involved in this conflict in, in Syria. The government's done so many things that have gone beyond what's considered to be humanitarian behavior. And this is all part of that. Construct. It's too bad the international community couldn't have come together two or three years ago and somehow found a way to evacuate Aleppo, but it, it didn't happen. And so uh, we're, we're stuck with the reality of what did happen. But I think that the, um, therefore, the recreation or re reconstruction of these places can be as important a symbol as the symbolic gesture of having destroyed them, and that's why it really has to be done. One of the first things, uh, the main thing World Monuments Fund did in um, Mostar was to uh, restore mosques that had been in the, uh, in the path of destruction because it's a rallying point for the whole community, and it does tend, people do come together uh, for a building that has great integrity and meaning and significance, who've lived together in peace in the past, even if they come from different um, faiths. And uh, I hope that the interfaith movement, as it's represented here in the uh, in various organizations in, in uh, surrounding the UN, will play a role in that, because it could be really one of the most significant things that could happen in the aftermath. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll just sort of bouncing off something Bonnie touched on. I think in terms of the interfaith aspect that, you know, a, a lot of the sites we look at in the film in the earlier sections than the one you've just seen are religious sites. And, um, you know, I think that it's, you know, unfortunately what happened in Bosnia, which we look at in the film and which Bonnie's touched on is, you know, the, the sort of the artificial... Um, separation that happened between Muslims and Catholics and Orthodox um, was obviously, tr you know, um, fatal in, in, in what happened in Bosnia. And, I, you know, talking to Bosnians about how they lived together, um, like literally together before this these artificial splits happened was, you know, just completely tragic. So hopefully there can be an avoidance of that in, in other cases in the world. Um, 
in terms of the first question, I agree with, um, I think Karim mentioned it, this, this sort of the hierarchy of sites is really problematic. And I think that's, you know, some a site like Palmyra, which obviously is is absolutely awful what happened to Palmyra, but, you know, there are, there are many other sites as well where things have happened and I think they all have to be taken together. Um, earlier In earlier parts of the film too, we do look at things like the, the bombing of Germany and, and other cases as well. So we tried to take a very holistic approach and, and one, you know, which is constantly trying to reiterate the position of that people and culture must be taken together, even though people like Daesh try and separate that and try and play off, you know, Western perceptions of weighing up one against the other. Um, and just finally, I just wanted to to mention that, you know, in terms of what Bonnie's talking about, the international res response, that um, I believe the UNHRC is, is looking into potential um, uh, war crimes and other uh, things that have happened in Syria. And, and hopefully, as part of that exploration of human rights abuses, that what's happened to the cultural fabric there and that link between human and cultural rights can be looked at as part of that process as well. Um, yeah. Okay, yep. Um, I forgot another question, but go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to yeah. add something about reconstruction because I certainly didn't want anything that I said about how irreplaceable tangible heritage is to be construed as sort of not recognizing uh, the importance of reconstruction. I do think it's incredibly important. I would just say a couple of things about reconstruction. One is that in a lot of my travel uh, as Special Rapporteur and in my missions, uh, talking to people, while they greatly value reconstruction, they're often very upset when reconstruction of sites that are very important to them or the groups to which they belong uh, is carried out without having consulted uh, them. And so one of the things I stress really in the report is, is the significance of the, the necessity for the widest possible con uh, consultation of stakeholders uh, in the process of reconstruction. Uh, and I think another thing that I've seen that is really important about reconstruction is picking up on what Tim said, when it can be used itself uh, to sort of mirror the process uh, of of reconstruction through reconciliation. So I visited a site, a monastery in um in Cyprus, uh, and the reconstruction project that is happening uh, there, the restoration, is actually bringing together Turkish Cypriot and Greek Cypriot experts working together on the site, and it seemed to me to be such a great model uh, for not only the end of the reconstruction being important, but the process being about reconstruction and social reconstruction as well. Excellent. Um, well, I have uh, one back there, and then Susan Gittles in the front row, and then the gentleman in the last row, and then this woman here. If we could take four questions all at once, and then we'll answer them together. Thank you. My name is Sophie Ravier. I work for the UN Department of Field Support, but until last August, I was, uh, have been for three years uh, the head of the Environmental and Culture Unit in Mali, in MINUSMA, the peacekeeping operation, and as was said by Mr. Kunders, who was my boss, <laughs> uh, that's the first peacekeeping uh, operation who got a mandate on cultural protection. Um, Few points, uh, if I may. Uh, the language, the mandate was to, call, to protect the sites, but the sites were already destroyed when we arrived. So that's uh, maybe a comment I will, I will ask from, uh, from the panel. Uh, what about the role of peacekeeping uh, in cultural protection? And the way we interpret it was, uh, of course, we try, as Mr. Kunder says, to find a way to work with the military and police, but we also uh, worked with UNESCO uh, to support them in the rehabilitation and the reconstruction of the mausoleums, but also the intangible heritage. Uh, like, you know, in Mali, the music, uh, the, all the instruments were destroyed, uh, dance and music were forbidden, so actually MINUSMA supported, uh, uh, they bought, again, instruments, etc., so that they could start, again, traditional events, etc. So, um, and I, I just wanted to um, add on what Karim has just said. Uh, the mausoleums in Timbuktu were rebuilt uh, by the local uh, communi communities using traditional methods, and that gives ownership. And they are even, I think now the mausoleums, I think that even the, the local population will even more protect, they will try to protect them more because there is uh, really a sense of, uh, you know, uh, participation in all that. So. Uh, role of peacekeeping. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, Susan in the front row. 
Susan Gittelson. Uh, you were showing us so well uh, destruction mainly by ISIS. And I can't help wondering what are other Middle Eastern actors doing to counter ISIS? Uh, Saudi Arabia as the protector, uh, various countries uh, um, with Lebanese, uh, the Moroccan, you know, where there is a tradition and, uh, and a, a desire to defend the faith. And what are they doing to counter ISIS? The gentleman in the back, I think. Uh, my name is Ding Feng, and I work for IOM. Uh, my question, actually, uh, the video reflected me of certain questions that I had uh, back in academia. And uh, one of them is, like, suppose if um, terrorists are using these cultural heritage as shelters, should, uh, if our, um, you know, drones or fighter jets fly over them, and bomb them, is, it, is that like legal or is that ethical? And secondly, um, if uh, you bomb them, you take them out anyways, should they be facing charges from the in, uh, International Criminal Court as well? All right. And then finally here in the third row. Uh, hello, and thank you for this great uh, opportunity from the film. Uh, my name is Cheryl Kazan, I'm the president of uh, World Council of Peoples for the UN and the Mexican Academy of International Law. And it's very interesting, I'm very grateful, looking at the film, I had the privilege of uh, seeing those sites as a child, and also last time was 2007. And to see it, of course, is heartbreaking, to say the least. It's not the only place in the world, but it's the most current. Um, my curiosity is in the trade of the incredible artifacts, whether it be underground or otherwise. Is there really like an Interpol police or otherwise, which even connects with other security institutions that really monitors this and actually tries to intercept it, or when there even is a buyer at the other end of the trade opportunity, that they can actually, shall we say, approach it? Are there penalties, or is it done secretly? It's very interesting. I come from a family where my father was in medical school in Germany before the war, and he was from Turkey and a passionate collector of everything and risked his life to save art and books and everything else, went to Geneva, then back to Turkey, into Mexico over time. And all I remember all my life is that we were hiding everything and waiting for someone to claim it or approach it, and we were offered all kinds of funds to sell them. Mm. That's nothing that we ever did, but it was always a tempting story in the world of trade. So I give that to you. Thank you very much. I think what we'll do is go in the same order as before. Karina, start with you also. A couple of those questions require an answer from a lawyer. So, uh, and then we'll just go in order and finish off. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'll just address questions one and three and leave the others for my colleagues. I, I'm very grateful for the question about peacekeeping. In fact, this is a recommendation which is very close to my heart uh, in the report that I'm presenting to the General Assembly tomorrow, which is specifically to incorporate cultural awareness as well as the safeguarding, restoration, and memorialization of cultural heritage uh, and respect for cultural rights in the mandate of peacekeeping missions. I, I think this is absolutely essential. Some missions. Uh, have indeed undertaken this. Others have been somewhat unclear as to what they were able to do uh, in this regard. And so I think it needs to be in there from the beginning uh, in the mandates. Now, I was thrilled that recently the UN Human Rights Council passed a very important resolution on uh, cultural rights and cultural heritage. Uh, unfortunately, one of the things that did not get included was the language about peacekeeping. So we have to keep that on uh, the table with experts like you who've had the field experience uh, in there. I think it's so important. Uh, the other point you made, which is critical, is about the link between tangible heritage sites, monuments, ruins, structures, and in intangible heritage of uh, folklore, uh, practices, uh, traditions, uh, music, languages, um, and so on. Uh, and everywhere I go, what people tell me is how interlinked these things are, that in some ways the separation we make uh, between them can be quite artificial, and that very often when tangible heritage is attacked, intangible heritage is 
also deeply impacted or itself uh, being assaulted at the same time. So in Mali, when the mausoleums uh, were being destroyed, music, uh, which, and Mali has one of the world's great musical traditions, uh, music was also banned. Those things really went together as a sort of, you use the expression, Bonnie, in the film, cultural engineering. Uh, and I think we really have to keep the issue of intangible heritage and its uh, preservation on the table as well. Uh, quickly on military necessity, the third question, uh, it's not actually a question you can answer uh, very fast, but it's an issue of great concern, again, something that I raise in the report. Uh, we have standards both in the Hague Convention and in uh, the second protocol, and I'm particularly fond of the second protocol, which unfortunately only has 69 uh, states' parties. We really have to do something uh, about that, raising that number. But the second protocol says that Military necessity only provides an exception uh, to the rule, the ban on uh, targeting cultural heritage when there is no feasible alternative available to obtain a similar military advantage and when the object in question has been transformed into a military objective. And one of the things that I argue in the report is that we have to interpret this exception very narrowly, and any law professor knows if you interpret an exception broadly, it swallows the rule. You don't have a rule anymore. Uh, and even if there is respect of these standards, of the humanitarian law standards, there still must be accountability and public scrutiny every time military action is taken anywhere that results in the damage of uh, cultural heritage. And absolutely last pitch, because I think it's the last time I'll take the floor. I'm sorry, I think I didn't say the side event on Thursday is at 5.30 in conference room 12, and this discussion will continue there. Thank you so much. Bonnie? Yeah, well, I'll take on that question of shelter also, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, illicit traffic. Um, it is actually against the Hague uh, Convention to fire on cultural sites uh, that are protected in conflict. And so uh, the United mm -hmm. States, as a member of the Hague Convention, would not fire on a cultural site in, if, in, if they were bombing, if, if there were that kind of military action. Uh, the, certainly the Syrian government, which is not a party to the Hague Convention, uh, simply ignored those kinds of, of protocols. And I think a lot of countries that are not formally part of these international agreements uh, still have um, ethical boundaries that would um, make them think twice about destroying cultural heritage and conflict. So after World War II, when a lot of uh, churches were used as shelters and uh, church towers were used by Nazi snipers, and the American army fired on them, and a lot of church towers were destroyed in France but, uh, during that time. Uh, that was a kind of line in the sand, and a decision was made after that that we really shouldn't engage in that kind of behavior again. So there are some standards. They're just not being followed in this particular war because this particular war doesn't follow the protocols of humanitarian um, protocols in, in, in times of conflict. Concerning the illicit traffic, the uh, the it, it's it's there's every indication that illicit traffic in uh, antiquities and objects, particularly coins that can be found through um, archaeological digging and looting, is all integrated with other forms of trafficking, including human trafficking, including the illicit sale of of oil and and um, kidnapping and all the things that the ISIS are involved with. And so it's very hard to separate it uh, in terms of enforcement or to look for, know who the people are, because the people are criminals. And uh, when these criminals are found with antiquities, which some, sometimes happens, uh, it, it aggravates the sense of the offense, but it doesn't stand, it's like other things cultural, doesn't seem to stand on its own as a pursuit that uh, the uh, courts and the enf enforcement people of this world uh, are really very interested in. There are also constraints on what pros information prosecutors can gather across uh, international boundaries. You probably know more about this than I do, which makes international prosecutions extremely complicated. And so uh, 
there isn't uh, a big safety net to uh, track this material as, as it's traveling around the world, nor have we got very specific documentation about which objects have disappeared and therefore why, uh, what are we looking for? And so the information that's circulated through an agency like Interpol, which has no enforcement capabilities, just a communications channel, tends to be um, more about types of things than it is about individual objects. The United States has passed a law uh, prohibiting the importation of antiquities from Syria if they are um, can be shown to have been exported after 2011. That was a over strenuous um, opposition from the antiquities trade, which uh, takes the point that there is a lot of legal and licit uh, material from this part of the world, and it's very hard to differentiate. So that, too, is a really pre pretty complicated issue. And then finally, on the peacekeeping, going back to the Bosnia conflict and even Cambodia, there have been efforts to get peacekeepers involved in this. And it, it's always been turned, <coughs> turned down and not really taken very seriously. So it would really be a great step forward. Uh, more damage always occurs after the fact than actually occurs in, in, in a moment of catastrophe. So there's so much more that could be done to prevent uh, worse things from happening on the ground in the aftermath of it when, when it's time uh, for people to come in and start the reconstruction process. So I hope you're successful with your recommendations. Thank you, Bonnie. Tim, you have the final word. Uh, yeah, look, there's not, a, there's not a lot to add, really, but... Um... Yes, uh, my understanding, to, to your point about penalties, as, as Bonnie's just been discussing, I think the UN Resolution 2199, which we look at in the film, again, as with, say, the Hague Convention, the onus then is on implementing national laws, right? So, I mean, it's it was sort of it, it, all of the state parties agreed to it, but it's a matter of implementing national laws to actually make that a reality. And just from perhaps going to some events talking about this issue, I, what I feel is that sort of sharing of knowledge is important between, say, Interpol and, and national um, agencies. Um, you know, I think that's sort of a key thing is sharing of data and information about how to integrate um, different points in the, the sort of trafficking pathway. Um, the yeah, look, the question about Middle East actors. I I'm not an expert in that, so I can't answer that very well. I know that certainly some states have, and that some Muslim religious leaders have sort of taken up positions against Daesh, and I, I just don't well, know. Certainly, it. the Iraqi army is trying to take back yes. a lot of territory, and yeah. they're, they're leading that. Yes. Uh, we've actually got about five or ten more minutes, and the bartender in the back knows to save me a glass of red wine, <laughs> which I'm only able to drink after this is over. So uh, this is the end of the formal thing. Please feel free to stick around. I'm sure all three of you are available to chat and talk about this subject. Uh, please join me in thanking this excellent panel and Tim for your wonderful film. Thank you.